So yes, uh, introduction to convolutional neural networks. Um, in this talk, I'll actually be, uh, it'll be in three parts. I'll explore the, these three questions by motivating why one would use uh, neural networks, then explore what they really are. And finally, I'll end by showing you how to use Python to train conv convolutional neural networks. And uh, if people are interested, uh, I can, I'll discuss some ideas and uh, things to pursue in this area as well. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I work as a researcher at the Fry University in the databases group here in Berlin, and I'm also a co-founder of a startup based in Switzerland and Berlin. Um, and we're actually looking at new ways of doing shopping and, and uh, using some of these ideas uh, there as well. Okay, to get started, um, uh, an important task uh, in uh, machine learning actually involves classifying some labeled data, like the properties of cer some certain uh, species of flower. Um, if you're given that and, and some name, its, its name, then you can predict what a particular species is just uh, given just its features, right? Uh, and uh, for two properties or features, um, and three types of uh, labels. Uh, you can use a simple uh, linear classifier, like the one here. Um, and so if you're given some unknown species, you can just uh, uh, see where it falls in, in, in this decision boundary, and you can predict its uh, type. You can predict its label. So it's an easy exercise. And you can imagine that uh, this classification was uh, uh, calculated or obtained by some kind of a minimization method which found the optimal decision boundary uh, that uh, by reducing or minimizing some cost and this was the computationally intensive part of, uh, of doing this. Um, many real-world problems on the other hand uh, do not separate out so nicely into more or less linear decision boundaries or and one way to deal with, the, with this is to introduce nonlinear features, like the square of the sepal length or the square of the, the width. And with these quadratic um, um, features, you end, up with, uh, you end up more or less with um, um, curved decision boundaries. And on the other hand, um, a lot of uh, interesting problems, especially these, these days, have a lot more uh, than a handful of features. Right? So a problem with, say, 100 features or dimensions, um, and uh, if we have cubic, uh, uh, if we have cubic uh, uh, features, well, that's already uh, 170,000 features now. And this kind of for each new dimension we add, it kind of grows, the computation kind of grows exponentially. And so there's a limit to, the, to, to what these methods can do as we increase their complexity. Right? So we very quickly hit, the, hit that limit. And if you consider the problem of uh, object recognition in images, uh, it's a simple problem for a brain, but computers only see pixels and even for a 32 by 32 pixel, we end up with 1,024 pixels. And if it's RGB, then it's 3,000 features. And so each input to our model is a vector of length 3,000, approximately 3,000, right? And that's just a 32 by 32 pixel. And now if we say if we want to fit a quadratic model, we end up with around 9 million features. And then a t 100 by 100 grayscale image, you have around 50 million quadratic features. So classical machine learning approaches are not a good way to learn such high dimensional models like image detection. Uh, so perhaps we can use an algorithm that tries to mimic the brain. And in particular, uh, the networks of uh, neural connections. And the theory is that this is the way the brain works in trying to, in, in learning complex uh, tasks. And there are a number of results that show that. 
this is a movie, by the way, of a working brain of an organism. You can see some of the, some of the neurons activating and uh, parts of the brain um, kind of using more oxygen. Anyways, I thought that was interesting. And so the main idea of uh, neural networks is to mimic these connections on a computer, to learn some features, and then for prediction, we see if a particular neuron is activated for some given input data. Right? So it's a relatively old, oldish idea, and they've kind of become the state-of-the-art technique these days for certain problems. But they had a bit of a lull uh, in their popularity in the 90s, around the time this movie was... Uh, was released, or maybe part three, I forget. I even remember my father uh, eventually changing his PhD from using neural networks uh, to something else around the same time. And yeah, so it wasn't too popular. Uh, these days, however, uh, they're among the most sophisticated uh, tools being used by all the big uh, technology giants like Google, with their Google Brain project. Microsoft also has uh, something called Project Atom. I suppose every big search engine uh, image aggregator has something similar um, that they're working on these days. And the reason, the main reason uh, for this resurgence is due to faster computers and accelerators like uh, graphics cards, as well as bigger, better labeled data for training, right? Uh, this, combined with the recent advances in the field over the last 10 years, uh, kind of mean that we can potentially use neural networks to learn very complex uh, features automatically and relatively quickly on commodity clusters like, uh, like those on Amazon, for example. So more or less uh, researchers and more smaller companies can do something similar for not so, for not, for not, for not, and it's not too expensive. And we'll get back to the GPU computing a bit later, but I first wanted to give you a higher level overview of how neural networks work in particular for uh, image uh, detection type problems and, and why they actually allow this uh, nonlinear learning. Uh, the simplest possible neural network uh, you can think of is just a single neuron. Uh, to, given by this diagram, and uh, this one's called the logistic unit, where the output is the logistic function, uh, which uh, outputs a, a probability between zero and one, given some, um, given some weights, uh, a coefficient vector beta. The x0, the x0 uh, is typically always one, it's called the bias unit, and it always outputs one, and kind of uh, has its reason uh, we have our reason for doing that. Um, it's an extremely simple model of what a neuron does and get, in that it gets a number of inputs and, 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 and some output is computed. Right? And in the neural network lingo, this, this beta is called, uh, is usually referred to as the weight. In terms of the computation, we're doing nothing more than just logistic uh, uh, classification here. Given some some weights, all we're doing is uh, just finding that decision boundary, that linear decision boundary. So uh, it's, this is nothing more than just logistic uh, regression. Um, you get a neural network when you put a bunch of these neurons together as uh, here. Again, a, a bit of more lingo, layer one is um, called the input layer, uh, the layer three, the last layer is the output layer. <clears throat> and this outputs our hypothesis, our model. Layer two in between, actually any layer in between is, uh, uh, are called hidden layers, okay? Um, so that's a very simple model of a, uh, of a neural network. And these functions, the AI, the A index uh, with the Js, are the activation functions of a particular neuron in a particular layer. So we, uh, we label uh, the superscripts are the layers and each of the unit activation functions are also numbered. Right? And for now, just consider that logistic function from uh, the last slide. 
Okay. Um, so how, uh, how, how, does, how does this work? Well, what's happening computationally is that for each of the, of some, for each uh, layer, we have some uh, given matrix of weights, which controls the function mappings from one layer to the next, right? And we can compute then for each uh, input image um, is, uh, is our, um, goes to uh, a corresponding um, input uh, unit and then for each, each activation function, we just calculate uh, with the, from the sigmoid function, uh, together with these weights, uh, the appropriate output. All right. And G is our, that sigmoid function, that, uh, that logistic function, for example. And then the final output for, is given by some other fixed uh, weight matrix, uh, theta two. And this, um, for some given uh, matrix, and this then returns our final um, kind of uh, hypothesis for a given data, okay? So computationally, that's all that's going on. You just uh, see what the, what the matrix is and what it's, um, um, what it's, um, uh, how, how we compute the, the activation for it. And it's just it defines a mapping from our input to our model, given some weight theta. And this is called forward propagation because we, we're kind of propagating the activations forward through, through the network. All right. Uh, just to give you an idea of how uh, we can use this to learn complex features now. Well, as an intuition, if we hit layer one and we're just left with layer two now, uh, this is just logistic regression and we're just using the features from layer two. So layer three just computes the normal logistic function and the weight matrix playing the role of the parameters and using the features A1 to uh, A3 in this case, right? So the great thing now is that these A1, A2, A3 are actually learned as functions of the input. So some other parameter, uh, uh, theta, theta one in this case, is choosing the parameters to then feed into layer three, which is doing logistic regressions. So now depending on what this theta one is set to via learning, via the process of learning, we can learn interesting features of our data, all right? So therefore we hope to get a better estimate than just polynomial classification because we have now the flexibility to learn whatever feature we want in order to get to, in order to get the layer two, uh, which we then feed into layer three, all right? So that's uh, the main, intuition of why you can learn nonlinear features. And of course, we can define our own uh, network architecture. Now layer two is computing uh, some complex feature and layer three is taking uh, these complex features and then computing even more complex features. And so by the time we get to layer four, we end up with a very sophisticated nonlinear model in essence. We can also extend this idea to multiple, multi-class logistic classification too, where for example, for the problem of object uh, recognition, we have more than one category which we are trying to distinguish between. Handwriting de detection is another example of multi-class uh, classification problems. And all we need to do there uh, is we generalize our output layer to have now multiple nodes, and each output is uh, then, a, uh, then a vector corresponding to the, to the, uh, the, the appropriate uh, output that we want. So in this case, we have two classes, and so we have these uh, vector of size two of probabilities. So, so that's a way to extend it. And given the weight parameters, it's relatively easy to make predictions now 
on new data via a feed-forward mechanism, which I described before. So now the issue is how do you choose these weight uh, parameters? Well, a naive thing to do would be to perturb the weight matrix randomly, and then uh, if it leads to a smaller mean square error, um, then you stick with that new weight, ma weight matrix and repeat. Well, it's not really efficient um, uh, usually, and so we don't do that. Another approach you could think of would be to maybe turn on and off some activation nodes, which is a bit better, but still not computationally optimal. So you turn on, on and off some node, and if it improves, improves the mean square error, you, you, you stick with that, otherwise you, you move on. There's actually a better approach called back propagation, which kind of back propagates the errors starting from the output layer. So it starts from the output layer and back propagates the, 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 the errors. And uh, it's kind of analogous to uh, running something like gradient descent on uh, some cost function of the activation functions. And uh, typically you also have a penalty for how much um, um, you're trying to minimize uh, something like ridge regression type um, penalties. And the idea is that by having this penalty, you make sure that only the most important features get learned. And this is actually the process which uh, we call training. And I, I don't want to talk any more about back propagation except that to say, to, uh, to get started, we need to initialize our weight matrix to some random values rather than just having them all zero. And, and once you do that, I mean, back propagation can be done rather efficiently. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's just an exercise in doing that. Um, as a recipe now, uh, we have now a whole technique for training neural networks. And this turns out to be you pick an architecture, you randomly initialize the weights, you implement forward propagation to get your, your model for any input x, then you implement code to compute this cost function, like the residual sum of squares plus some penalty. Then you implement back propagation and to minimize the cost function for the best theta, the best weight. And then you um, you train your neural network from with the training data to find find this best theta. And we'll probably not find a global optimum, but gradient descent actually does quite a good job in uh, minimizing this cost function. All right, so we have our basic neural network and we can, we can train it now. So for the problem of feature extraction in images, well, the thing with images is that um, um, a fully connected network with, with even a 32 by 32 image is computationally quite ex intensive. And um, one solution is that each hidden unit is connects to a small subset of input units. Uh, but even that turns out to be quite computationally in intensive. You end up with a lot of um, uh, these uh, fully connected units. And, and the thing about images is that they have this property which is um, called, uh, which is that they're kind of stationary, meaning patches of the images kind of repeat um, around the images. And this suggests that the features that we learn at, at one patch of the image can be applied to other patch of the image. And so we can use the same feature, this learned feature in different locations of the image. Uh, the thing is, if you, if, you, if you did that, for example, if you had four by four patches sampled randomly over a large image and apply this, you end up again with a huge number of uh, features once again. And it's, it's, um, it's much more efficient, it's better if we would take these four by four features and actually convolve them with the larger image. This way we obtain kind of a, 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 a classification of those patches, which is a bit smaller dimensional than the patches themselves at each, uh, at each place where we are doing the, this filtering. So what is convolution? 
Well, it's kind of a mathematical operation of uh, taking a filter function, which is the size of your patch, and applying it to the image to get a number or, or a smaller representation of that patch. All right? Uh, doing this uh, for Oops. Doing this for patches, we end up with uh, a layer of convolved features. Um, and after obtaining features, we would next like to use them, these features for classification. And in theory, you could uh, use all these extracted features uh, with the classifier. But again, this is too computationally intensive due to the large number of features. But there's also the risk of uh, now overfitting the model. Uh, you end up with so many features that uh, uh, it, it works perfectly for your uh, training data but uh, fails miserably for any new test data. So we need to fix this uh, now overfitting uh, issue. One thing we can do is, um, if you remember that we decided to obtain these conv convolved features because it, Images have this stationary property, which implies that features that are useful in one region are also likely to be useful in other regions. Uh, so to describe a large, n large image, one, could naturally, one uh, natural approach is to aggregate statistics of these features at various locations. For example, one could compute the mean or max values of a particular feature over a region of the image. And so you can use these summary statistics, which are much lower dimension, dimensional compared to the extracted features. And uh, they actually improve uh, the, the result for uh, learning, because uh, now you have much less overfitting. You have much less uh, features that you're learning over. And these aggregate operations are called pooling. Depending on the type of statistics, it's either mean pooling or max pooling. And, and um, one can choose the pooling region to be contiguous areas in the image and only pool features generated from the same hidden unit. And these units will be translation invariant. That's another property. This means that the same feature will be active even when the image undergoes some small translation. And this translation invariance features uh, is uh, often desirable in um, many tasks like object uh, recognition or even audio recognition. All right. Um, what did I wanted to say? I think now we have more or less everything to describe a convolutional neural network, which is a neural network compo composed of one or more convolutional layers often with some sub, a subsampling step, and then followed by one or more fully connected layers. And the architecture of a convolutional neural network is designed to take advantage of the, this 2D structure of an input image. Uh, and the 2D input uh, like, uh, like an, can also be like a speech signal, for example. And um, Another benefit of uh, these convolutional neural networks is that they're easy to train and have much fewer parameters than those fully connected uh, neural networks with the same number of hidden units. So by doing these uh, convolutions, you end up with much fewer parameters. So how do we do that in Python? Well, uh, in Python, uh, there are a number of convolutional neural network libraries. Uh, the popular ones are the CUDA ConvNet, or on Covenant 2, which uh, was released a few days ago. Uh, PyBrain is also um, used, and CAFE is uh, actually um, uh, another really nice uh, library. You can even do it yourself with uh, Theano and PyLearn2 backends for a lot of the heavy um, GPU computations. So it's not too hard to, to just do it yourself. Uh, Today I wanted to look at CUDA ConvNet, which is a fast uh, C++ or CUDA implementation of uh, these uh, neural networks. And uh, you can, with it, you can model arbitrary layers of connectivity and network depth. And uh, it works on NVIDIA GPUs. And um, the main advantage is that it kind of provides efficient implementations of convolutions in uh, for uh, 
CUDA GPUs. And um, you can uh, get uh, the um, uh, um, uh, you can get the code from uh, GitHub and um, uh, this one, uh, this library from uh, Daniel is uh, particularly nice because it kind of, it's uh, easy to get going with it. And it kind of is a mirror of the original code. So to get started, uh, the main advantage of, um, of, uh, of this uh, GitHub uh, library is that uh, we use CMake to build the CUDA bindings for Python. So if you have, uh, if your setup has a recent uh, CUDA CPU, a GPU, and all the development environment set up, then all you really need to do is uh, just call CMake on it, and uh, more or less you'll be ready to go to start using it. Of, you also need matplotlib and uh, the appropriate LAPAC uh, libraries as well. So to begin with, uh, let me just discuss the type of data that uh, we can train on. CUDA ConfNet expects data to be stored at, as Python pickle objects. And the other thing is that the data must be broken down into these batches. And uh, here I have a data set uh, consisting of 60,000 32 by 32 color images in 10 classes with uh, 6,000 uh, images per class. And the data set is divided into five uh, training batches and one test batch, each with um, 10,000 images in, in the Python pickle format. And CUDA Confident comes with the uh, utilities to, to, um, to, to generate uh, from your image data to these pickle formats. And to, so to define the architecture of your neural network, you must first write a layer definition file. The first thing you need to add to your layer definition file is a data layer. The type data line indicates that this is a data, data layer. And our Python data provider outputs a list of two elements, the actual image and the label for the image. And so the line data index zero indicates that the layer name data is mapped to the, the, to the image and similarly, the line data index one indicates that this is the label, uh, it maps to the labels of that uh, image. Next, uh, a convol convolution layer applies a small set of filters, as I said, all over these images, and you specify them like this. The conv one bracket is the name that we're calling this layer so we can reference it in other, uh, other layers. Input equals data says that the layer will take as input the layer name data of three channels, and we apply 32 filters to this image. We then add a padding of two image uh, pixel borders of zero and a stride of one to indicate the distance between these successive filters. Um, and the convolution filter size is five by five with some initial weight in this layer from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation 0.001, right? Uh, this partial sum parameter is a kind of a, um, affects the performance of the, 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 com the gradient computation and it's worth trying out different values for it as well. Uh, another type of layer is the pooling layer. Um, here, it performs local per channel pooling on its input. We use max pooling rather than average or mean pooling. And the input here you see can, uh, comes from the conf1 layer and we use a rectified uh, linear neuron, a type of neuron. We can define other types of neurons uh, here as well. A fully connected layer you, uh, is of type FC, fully connected. And it gets its input from some pool three layer. Here, actually, we're defining two layers. FC64 is a fully connected layer and with 64, 64 outputs. And the probs is a softmax that takes that, those uh, FC64 as input and outputs, uh, uh, outputs things that can be interpreted as probabilities. And this type of layer is useful for actually for classification tasks. 
Finally, uh, uh, your architecture configuration must define an objective function to optimize. Here we're defining this multinomial logistic regression objective. It's uh, specified uh, like this with cost.log regression. It takes two inputs, the true labels and the predicted probabilities, and we define the label, we define the labeled uh, layer er earlier on. And the probability layer we get from the softmax layer. So more or less, uh, you, once you have that done, uh, you ne also need a, a parameter file for each of the layers. In this file, you can specify your learning parameters where, where, that you want to change during the course of training. Um, the thing is that uh, ConfNet checkpoints its operation so you can go back and, and uh, change these parameters and restart the computation. Uh, once you have uh, something going. And uh, yeah, so to get started, once we have these two files and we have the data in the pickle format, we can actually do the training. Uh, this, this command will cause the net to train on the data uh, located in the data path and save checkpoints to the save path folder. So it uses batches, you can see it uses batches one to five uses batches one to five for uh, training and batch six for testing. And for every 13 training batches, it uh, processes will compute the test error once. And the testing frequency is also the checkpoint saving frequency. So every 13 uh, epochs, every 13 times we uh, loop over, we do a checkpoint. And the output actually tells you the epoch and the batch number, as well as the values of all of the objectives that we're optimizing. The cost.log regression objective happens to return two values, the average and negative log probability of the data under the model, um, and the classification error rate, which is the second number. You see that uh, even uh, we did a few epochs here, and we're at 36.7% classification error. This training will by default continue uh, till 50,000 epochs by default, but you can uh, change that as well. And, um, to see the results or see, to look inside your uh, neural network at any time, uh, you can use the show net script. It plots the training test error over time and displays um, you can also use it to display the filters that the neural network has learned and uh, also plot the predictions and errors like I'm doing here. All right. um, so as we go um, more for, forward, our training error will keep decreasing and at some point we'll be, uh, we will be, um, we will start um, uh, the, the test error will start increasing because of overfitting. To view the filters that we, the, has, uh, the, the network has learned, well, we call this, the script with the show filters and give it the layer, the name of the layer. This kind of uh, is visualization is mostly useful only for looking at data connected layers. The deeper you go into the into your network, the less uh, interpretable these uh, outputs become. Right. And if, uh, if if your output has three channels, it it merges in into a RGB uh, file, but uh, it doesn't mean these colors don't mean anything. To actually do some predictions on some test data. Um, you can run the show net script with the show pro show with the show predictions probabilities. This uh, shows eight random images from the test uh, batch. They're true labels and the four labels considered most probable by the model. The true labels probability is shown in red, uh, and. Um, um, you can see here it did quite well. Only one image was uh, misclassified as a frog rather than a dog. So not so bad. Uh, these uh, neural networks actually suffer a lot from, uh, uh, from um, 
overfitting. So let me just briefly talk about uh, regularization, uh, which is the, this idea of, um, of uh, only choosing um, the features that are the most important. Um, one way of regularization is called dropout, introduced by Hinton. Uh, when training with dropout and randomly selected, the subset of activations are set to zero within each layer. And the reason for this is that kind of outside the scope here, but it prevents complex co-adaptions in which a feature detector is only helpful in the context of several other feature detectors. By doing dropout, each neuron kind of learns to detect a feature that is generally helpful for producing the correct answer, uh, given the, com the, the large variety of internal contexts in which it must operate. So it kind of is the most important, you kind of select the most important ones. Another uh, recent uh, technique is called Drop Connect, which uh, instead sets a randomly selected subset of weights within the network to zero. So uh, CUDA CompNet also implements uh, these. I think Drop Connect is in a separate branch and hasn't been merged yet, but uh, yeah, you can play around with these two techniques as well. And a number of uh, Kaggle competitions have actually been won using convolutional neural networks. This one to classify galaxies uh, needed four convolutional layers and three fully connected layers. And it actually finished first. And this blog post uh, kind of uh, goes into a lot of detail into uh, uh, what, what the author did to, to, to win the challenge. Also for speech, recognition, convolutional neural rec networks uh, work quite well. Um, let me finish up by uh, talking a bit about the issues of paralyzing convolutional neural networks. Uh, typically, we train these networks over big data sets. It's not obvious how to actually par parallelize this training. Um, Multi-GPU seems one approach. It's um, Parallelizing them over a cluster is another approach, but there's actually no standard framework for doing this large-scale um, learning like there is for uh, Hadoop, uh, like there is for MapReduce with Hadoop or uh, streaming computation with Spark or, St or Storm. So there's something missing in this, uh, in this area. Um, so one way to parallelize neural network is, is across the model dimension. So different workers train different part of the model or across the data where different workers train on different data examples. Each has its own drawbacks and benefits, actually. In practice, uh, what people find, and this data parallelism appears to be attractive for convolutional layers, where, which contains about 90% of the computation and about 5% of the parameters, while model parallelism appears attractive for fully connected layers, which constitutes about 5 to 10% of the total computation. And most of the parameters are here. So there's a kind of a change in regime of how you parallelize things. And it's, uh, it can get quite complicated. In terms of... Uh, improving the, your training times, the algorithms also need to be designed to take advantage of the architecture, in particular the GPUs and multi-core multi CPUs. And the main difficulty here is uh, if you look at this uh, architecture of, uh, of, a, of a newish uh, system with the, with the CPU and the GPU, the main problem is uh, transferring data through these bottlenecks, the PCI bus, as well as the, the network. So this is the fastest you can get at, at these days. But um, this is where the main bottleneck is as you transfer memory from your host to your device for the GPU to work on it. This is quite fast. So all these are in, in kind of in, in scale. All right, and the trick here is to kind of hide latency of these transfers by doing computation in parallel to the transfers so that the GPU multiprocessors are kept busy and are not left waiting for some data to arrive. And this is uh, hard, especially when you have multiple GPUs in the server. And the new CUDA ConfNet 2 is written with this uh, kind of philosophy in mind to, to optimize it for multi-GPUs. So, uh, if you want to explore that, have a look at uh, CUDA ConfNet 2. 
All right, so I think uh, hopefully you get an idea of the, gen the general method, the techniques of using convolutional uh, neural networks, and I encourage you to go and try out these libraries and perhaps uh, with some sample data or your own data and explore new ideas. And uh, I'll stop here for any questions or, or feedback. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, how do you define or determine the number of layers and neurons that make sense most for a given situation? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, so. You have to um, have to play around with the with the how much features get detected with training and test data sets. And so, typically, you would have three or four convolutional layers, uh, and um, typically you would have uh, things in which are multiples of two, multiples of two, and so 64, uh, so things that divide up nicely and are easily cached. And so you need to try, try it out, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, so that's another thing lacking with the neural networks is that uh, it's hard to interpret what's actually going on, and uh, that's another active area of research. Um, thank you. Uh, recently, Google and Facebook have shown some uh, some success with uh, neural networks, and uh, especially uh, Deep Face from Facebook. Um, can you give us some insight if you have um, how they parallelized uh, yes. their yeah? So deep most nets? probably they have they have a kind of a framework for doing for doing this. Uh, for for doing this kind of uh, parallelism, kind of a easier kind of libraries, internal libraries and frameworks, APIs for doing that. This is currently missing in the open source space. So it's a, it's a request for perhaps Python can uh, be the go-to framework for such a system. So most probably they have kind of these uh, parameter servers and I think Jeff Dean talked about it as well, and kind of the challenges. And as a, as a complement to that, uh, there was a blog post uh, some time ago uh, by Netflix uh, who explained how they scaled ConvNets uh, to the cloud, and that's actually tied to some talks we had on hyperparameter optimization. Yes. There are many hyperparameters, so what you can do is have an Amazon GPU instance for every point in your grid search, so for every possible hyperparameter, and that way you don't need to parallelize at the convnet level. You just try many, many convnets, and in practice what works the best is any way to mix the predictions of multiple convnets. So yes. that's a way to scale up. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, that's I it. I thank you. Uh, thanks, Kashi.